Oh, and mute me. Are you muted? Yeah. All right. And uh, and you need to go back to sharing. Yeah, I just have wait waiting for it to catch up. Um, I'm not seeing it yet, but it's probably catching up. We haven't done this for, there it is. Beautiful. All right. So cool. I'm going to introduce Where do I stand? It's a wide angle lens. Good with yeah, good. Both of us are director. No. All right. So, welcome, welcome to uh, the the first idea talk for the fall 2018 season. We the the fall of 2018 is packed full of of our pirates, uh, RPIR users group meetings, uh, idea talks by uh, mostly by uh, graduate students associated with idea. And the Tethers World Constellation talks, TWED talks, um, which will be down in Amos, um, down in Winslow, eleven forty, and you will all find out about all of these through uh, through uh, email. Um, uh, welcome uh, to uh, Andrew Yale, who's giving a kind of a, re a return performance with updates about his work on, on creating synthetic data. Uh, Andrew is. PhD grad student working with Kristen Bennett um, and all. Um, and he'll tell you more about what he's doing, but uh, take it away, Andrew. Thank you. Sure. And, uh, one, one logistical thing. Um, as we try to do with Idea Talks and Twitch Talks, this is being recorded and streamed live, so you're, you're welcome to ask questions, but just keep that in mind. Uh, okay, so yeah, my name is Andrew Yale. I'm a PhD student here at RBI. Um, and I'm working on creating synthetic data using uh, generative adversarial networks. Um, today, I'm going to kind of focus on Buster Stein GANs and synthetic data vault. Um, but I'm going to kind of go over some basic building blocks to get there in the um, But just to talk about kind of broad strokes why I'm doing this, um, <coughs> this is uh, part of a grant that is focusing on, this is part of a grant that's focusing on trying to bring. Uh, data to students to be able to, to, to learn how to use, analyze uh, different types of data in the classroom setting. And so specifically what we're talking about is situations where students aren't going to be allowed access to the real data. So the big one here is healthcare data. Um, and so for healthcare data, you can't share, um, I mean, you can't share with anyone healthcare data uh, under laws like HIPAA. Um, and so the idea here is that if we can generate synthetic healthcare data, uh, we can have students learn from that healthcare data and be, and, and I mean, learn new types of data sets, but also it, it's more valuable experience when they go into the working world, they can go to somewhere that has health data and they don't have to be onboarded for a number of months and introduced to different data sets and stuff like that. So just to give you the scope of why we're doing this. Uh, okay, so first I'm just going to talk about generative adversarial networks in kind of the abstract. Um, so. <clears throat> the the idea behind a, a, a GAN, as they're also commonly called, is um, to create synthetic data. And so the, the way that this works is there are two different neural networks here, so D and G, the generator and the discriminator. And basically what they're doing is they're trying to fight each other <coughs> and, and find an equilibrium. And so basically what's happening is you're feeding into your discriminator uh, real data and generated synthetic data. And so the idea is that your discriminator is then being able to is is able to determine the difference. Able to, basically, it's a neural network that figures out whether the data passed in is real or fake. And um, then our generator is trying to work against that. And so our generator is trying to create data that will fool the discriminator. So we're trying to improve our discriminator to be able to to discriminate between real and generated data. And we are trying to improve our generator to fool our discriminator. So obviously they're working at 
uh, at odds to each other. So we're trying to find a balance between them. Too. So here's uh, some of the examples from the first GAN paper, for instance. So um, over here to the left, <laughs> um, in the yellow boxes, these are real. So this is the MNIST data set. Let me back up, I guess. So this is the MNIST data set, which is handwritten digits uh, taken off of, I believe, um, envelopes. These are zip code numbers. Um, and so the, and so basically what, what the left side is here is trying to generate samples. And these are um, kind of the closest to those samples. And so these actually do look like digits. Right. Um, as we get to these more complicated examples, it kind of falls down a little bit, <laughs> um, but you still see some like rough facial features and uh, some rough shapes in these. Uh, this was from the first paper. Obviously, it's improved a lot since, but just to give you an idea of what we're working. On. Uh, so sorry, the generated images are the ones not in yellow. Correct. The yellow are from the real data set. The closest images that uh, match. <laughs> Uh, from the real data set, like each row. <laughs> um, so, so some of the things that so obviously again can be kind of improved. Um, a lot of those images showed where where some of those holes might lie. Um, one of the big problems is something called mode collapse. So this is from um, <clears throat> I believe uh, I forget the name of the data set, but these are these are supposed to be. Um, these are generated samples from a, a data set that's images of rooms. And so what's important here, what mode collapse is, is basically the generator can learn a way to trick the discriminator. And, and, and it knows a certain data point that will always work. And it just keeps outputting that data point. So that's something we want to make sure we don't do is that basically if the generator can find you know 10 data points that always work, it'll just keep outputting those 10 data points. So we want to avoid that. So what you can see here. Is there are like five, six that are all outputting basically the same image, right? Like we have all these other ones that are different, but we see a bunch that are basically the same pattern. Because if for some reason the GAN figured, the generator figured out if I output this pattern, the discriminator will be fooled when. <laughs> um, and so that's something we want to avoid. Um, another thing is um, vanishing gradients. So basically the ability to kind of like a, a diminishing returns on our, on our training ability. Um, so right, so <clears throat> the original GAN formulation uses, um, or, or frequently uses either the KL or the JS divergence to kind of measure the, di the distance between the distributions. And as those get farther away, you can have you can have these um, these asymptotic uh, gradients. And basically, it means that if we're in a spot over here, so so the idea just to kind of explain this graph a little bit is let's say our real distribution is at zero. The mean of our real distribution is at zero. We have some Gaussian right here. And we have uh, the mean of our fake distribution over here at like 25. Our gradients are pretty flat, so we don't really know where to go, how far to go. It, it, it makes it training really hard at that point. Um, so how do we fix that? Um, so the Wasserstein GAN um, uses the Wasserstein distance or the Earth mover distance, um, which to explain that a little bit. Let's say we have this discrete, these two discrete distributions. And so they're obviously different. And so we, we want to calculate the difference between these two discrete distributions. The way the Earth mover distance works is you would take like a chunk from P1 here, you would move it over. That's going to you know, cost two to move over these two units in the discrete sense. Um, you would do it again, kind of match Q3 here. So that would be another two, so we have four so far. And then we're going to move over one more um, from the uh, end, or, right? Yeah. Uh, and so you would get a, a total cost of five to move. So it's just kind of measuring that. And obviously, it's calculated for a continuous sense. But this is supposed to be the, the logic behind it, that it's just moving around pieces to find the minimum distance between two distributions. And the nice thing about that is that you have non-vanishing ingredients. So basically, this, this is kind of like, this red curve is kind of the reverse of what I showed you before. Basically, we have our, our gradients that are going to zero here when our two distributions are this far apart. If this green one was closer to here, we would have you know good gradients, but we lose them as we get over to here. And then with the Wasserstein GAN, we have gradients all the way through. Yes? Uh, is there a, like, a certain threshold above, uh, like, for instance, uh, empirical distribution size where 
get in the closed form solution of uh, earth movers distance is, is not tractable anymore? That's a good question. Um, not that I know of, but I'm not sure. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. So, so the the other big words that are used for these to compare these is discriminator and critic. And so the idea with the GAN implementation is we have a discriminator. Basically, um, I think one of the examples used is a a um, discriminator is like an art. Um, I can't the word. But basically, somebody somebody can tell forgery, and they they just say you know zero or one, real or it's fake. They're just discriminating on, on that. And then the critic is somebody who is 60% sure it's real, or it's 60% more real than the last one. Uh, and so that's the idea here is that we can kind of see whether where the discriminator might be able to tell whether the data is real or not, the Wasserstein GAN can tell you how real it thinks it is. Yes? So is that? Uh, is the Wasserstein, is the critic using more of a markup thing? Is that what I'm, like, this kind of um, system right? No, it's just, it's just that the, because of the way, so it's, it's, it's with the distance. So basically the distance is telling you how far away it is or not, versus the KL and the JS divergence were telling you it's far enough away or it's not far enough away. Okay. Yeah. So it's basically just a sliding scale, and that's why they used to like to use the word critic. So you think of like somebody rating versus somebody deciding. So it's a little bit better in that sense. Does that make sense? Yep. Cool. Um, so okay, so that's kind of the Wasserstein GAN. Um, uh, some of the other things um, that they've done with the Wasserstein GAN is introduce things like gradient penalties and stuff like that, which I won't necessarily go into right now because I think that's a little too in the weeds. But I would encourage you to read. There's uh, a paper called Wasserstein GAN, and then there's a paper called Improving Wasserstein GANs, uh, and they kind of go off of each other um, for more information. <coughs> which one is this figure from? This one? Yeah. Um, I believe this is just from the Bastrosan GAN. So the oh, okay. improving the Bastrosan GAN is talking about the gradient penalties. Uh, to kind of overview that, basically they were using weight clipping before to improve. Uh, so basically, if, if your weights on your uh, network got to a certain point, they would just be thresholded. Whereas with gradient penalties, they can avoid using weight clipping and uh, still get and get better results without having to do weight clipping, which is just kind of slow because it, it's. It's, it's like unintentionally moving your weights where they didn't want to be, so you learn at a slower rate. Um, okay, so we saw was one of the other things we saw with GANs is that these were initially used for images. Um, there's another great story about how GANs started that you should you could read, uh, which is that Ian Goodfellow, guy who created GANs, I believe, probably gonna butcher the story, but it basically he was arguing with a friend at a bar about this, and this is where he came up with the idea of GANs. But it was about image <laughs> generation. A good story. Uh, I was really careful when a machine learning guy says, here, hold my beer. Yeah, yeah. I think he implemented it that, that night is the story. He yeah. came home and implemented it that night. Um, but anyway, <laughs> um, so it's, it's used for images, and that was the, the whole point of the story is basically they were trying to create synthetic images and they were so so a lot of the research in this area has been driven towards images. The nice thing about images is they're very uniform uh, in terms of their data type and style. So um, any of one of these images can be encoded into an array of just values from zero to two fifty six. And you know if you want you can stack them on top of each other so you can do convolutional neural networks and stuff like that. But it's all very straightforward once you have the data. Um, for health data that's not really the case. Uh, we've got dates, we've got categories, we've got uh, integers, we've got binary data, you know, we've got continuous data. So those don't really cohesively go together like straight into the game. So the other half of my talk here is talking about uh, data formatting. So you want similarly structured data. They work really well. Um, if you, I mean, if you just think about generating synthetic data, if you have one column that has values from 0 to 256 and one column that's from 0 to 1, the GAN doesn't know that. It knows that, oh, well, some of this data over here might look like it goes all the way up to 256 and this data doesn't. So, you know, you can generate, easily generate values that just don't make any sense. Um, so, originally used to image data. And so DC GAN is a deep convolutional 
neural network again. Um, convolutional layers basically uh, look at the relationship between um, the cells around it, which works for pictures, but doesn't work for our data because the rows below it doesn't necessarily matter as much as the columns next to it. Um, so we look at the synthetic data vault format. Uh, so the synthetic data vault um, is, is another generative method. Uh, I'm basically just taking their formatting aspect of it and using that. But that's a whole other generative method that I could also do another presentation about if I wanted to. Uh, but basically, they just like look at the relationship between different tables in a relationship relational database, and they generate data using those relationships recursively. So another interesting one. Too. But basically, what I'm trying to do is, is convert all of my data from about continuous values from zero to one. So everything is, is nice and easy. Um, so, um, but. So, so numeric, pretty easy, just scale the data, done. Um, uh, but it gets more complicated as you go into things like categorical data, uh, binary data, uh, dates. And so what we end up doing is with our categorical data, this is kind of the method that they have, they have developed. So let's say we have a column where 40% of our values are yeses, 50% of our values are nos, and 10% of our values are maybes. Basically, we're going to order them from uh, most, most common to least com common, and then we're going to fit these truncated Gaussian distributions to each of them, centered on the, the middle of their, their window. Excuse me. And um, so from there, we kind of we kind of have our we have our distributions, and we can so, so when we come upon a value that we're trying to convert to this format, and it's a yes, we just sample from that Gaussian that truncated Gaussian. Um, and so it, it keeps them nice and clustered to the middles of the categories. Um, and then at the end, we can convert them back out. Um, and then that, that, that works for categorical data. It also works for binary data. Uh, you know, zero is one category, one is another category. Um, and then dates, um, what they end up using is converting it to the Unix timestamp, uh, you know, seconds since the epoch, and then you can do uh, numeric, or you can do a categorical. And that, I think that can kind of make, that kind of, you need to have the, you need to decide based on your data whether it's like time, whether these are really categorical timestamps or whether it's a more of a continuous scale. Uh, if you want to predict the future, you might need to do even further stuff. But I haven't been doing as much with dates, but that's, uh, that's a whole new area. Um, does, it, does that make sense here? Yes. Does it matter for this method if, uh, <coughs> if your categorical variable is, is ordered or not? Ordered or not. Or like, um, let's say like mm. uh, low, medium, <coughs> high, that has a natural mm -hmm. ordering to it, but like mm. red, red, blue, green doesn't. That's true. So that might be something to, to, to consider, yeah. Um, I don't think any of the categories I have have that, so I haven't done that, but that definitely could be something to consider to consider because it could make more sense. So the reason they order by most po most common to least common <coughs> is that when you when you are, are meeting at these bounds, it's more likely going from this to this, like just say, you know, numbers wise. Yeah. But I agree with what you're saying is that maybe if in something where it is a little bit more of that kind of scale, yeah. having those boundaries together might make more sense. Could you use the same thing for or same principle for imputation? <laughs> kind of. Um, I, you know, I, this this came through my mind the other day yeah. when we were talking about this as well. You might be able to. You have to yeah, you might be able to. Yeah. I think this is sort of, sort of, kind of what mice does: multiple imputations to change equations. I think it's kind of somewhat. Okay. But so. But yeah. the, the idea is, if you get the probability distribution, you know, for for category or data or whatever in a column right. with missingness and then trying to match that in order as you're substituting in imputed values. Yeah. Yeah, it might be able to be used for that. That is true. Hmm. Um, okay. So uh, to talk about the Bastion kind of workflow. Um, so speaking of missing values, uh, create a complete data set with no missing values. So one of the things that GANs at least uh, through my research, uh, I haven't been able to see uh, methods that really take care of missing values well. So it is kind of unfortunate, but basically you need a complete data set to be passing it through. Um, and then I convert it to the synthetic data fault format. I run it through my Vastrosign GAN, and then I convert it back out, and then I have some synthetic data. Uh, 
Oh, and then so talking about some for, for me personally, just uh, to keep you up to date with my research. Um, so one of the things that I will say about the, the the GANs in general is that they don't really create outlier and rare data, which can be an issue with medical data because a lot of people are outliers. <laughs> so that is definitely something to uh, kind of focus on. Uh, obviously, with images, you don't really want to necessarily create the outliers. You don't want to create the person with a really messy handwriting. It's probably not worth it. But in medical data, it's a little bit more important. So. Um, so things like the synthetic data vault format could be changed to have overlapping distributions or stuff like that to to change uh, to try and like change the distribution of the data, um, and then so some of the other things could, you could do are like change the loss in the Vashtang end to not try to penalize as much higher data or something like that. But it is tricky. Um, same with rare categories, similar idea. Um, and yeah, so. Do you have any pictures? <laughs> uh, the GAN at the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the live, what I meant was, you know, the, the last time you presented, you were showing sure. that some really interesting results that you had shown previously about how it was um, predicting uh, comorbidities, that it was your, your methods were generating these. Right, yes, yes. Um, I don't have as many interesting things about that, which is a good thing, I think. But <laughs> yes, so I mean that's but that's an, that is an instance. So just to uh, talk about that, that's an instance where the the ish, the one of the issues with things like GANs, things like neural networks, is that they're not as explainable in why they're doing what they're doing. Um, so what was happening there was the this was using uh, the MedGAN which is a different type of GAN implementation specifically designed for binary diagnosis data. And the idea was that they really wanted to enforce column sparsity. So basically, the amount of times this disease shows up in the data set should be the same in the synthetic data and the real data set. Makes sense on the surface, but the issue there is that when you create synthetic patients, um, there were patients where in the original data set, out of a thousand diagnoses, they were having the maximum, the person with the maximum number of diagnoses was, I think, at 100, maybe. And in the synthetic data set, we would have people close to 500, which doesn't really make any sense. And when you looked at it, a lot of the values that they had were the very uncommon ones. So basically, the generator was generating a row that was kind of taking all of those really rare diseases and just throwing it into that row to kind of fool the discriminator into saying, like, look, this entire data set looks fine. Except for this one guy. <laughs> um, so, so, so that is one of the things. So, uh, mini batch averaging and, and stuff like that have been used in other GAN implementations. Um, it's not a, it used as much in the Wasserstein GAN, and that part of that is because you can do because you have the critic ability. You, can, um, you get a, a more relative score of where the data lies versus um, in regular GAN where it's like zero or one. Um, so, yes. yes. Okay, I guess I'll look. So one thing I'm really curious about, and then I know that um, I've been mentioned in one of the uh, video conferences I was on when we were talking about this, is the, the issue of, which relates to what you were saying, which is uh, adding some sort of uh, encoding constraints into your algorithm so that it accounts for things like there's not somebody with 500 diseases. Mm. Um, and there's other things too, right, that you can add in to make it more make your data more fun with reality. Right? right. So could you talk a little bit about maybe some other things that you've done? Sure. On that, on that so, so for instance, for the, the MedGAN, um, one of the things that they were using part of their, um, their structure was using an autoencoder, um, which basically takes data, encodes it into a smaller space. Uh, so you know, it takes your 1,000 uh, thousand long row and encodes that down, down into like 10 variables that don't necessarily mean as much, but they're, you know, Getting the essence of the thousand, and then it decodes it back out. And so the idea with, uh, and so what I used was I switched to being a sparse autoencoder, which tries to enforce some of that sparsity, like acknowledging the fact that the data will be sparse, and therefore um, not inserting too many more. So you, so you have, you won't create rows that have more than a hundred. Um, that works to some extent, but um, when you're putting too much weight on things like the column sparsity, it can stop working. So, so it helped have, a little bit, but it's going to have like one diseases. Hmm? So you could have like too strong. It's too strong. You could have too strong, or or it depends on how much you weight it in terms of 
you're you're trying to create that you have the sparse autoencoder enforcing the sparsity constraints, but if your column sparsity constraint is is in your loss, whereas the encoding is is not, the loss kind of takes priority over that. So it'll still basically you would get situations where you're still having these high sum rows, you're just not as high. And you can enforce a higher sparsity, but then you would get, you know, people with one or two diagnoses that, you know, maybe you wanted to have so it's find, finding a balance, basically, like hyperparameter tuning, I would say, for that. Um, so you do things like that. Um, changing the loss, though, is, I think, one of the, the bigger ways. Um, so, yeah. Uh, I have two questions. <laughs> so first, uh, have there been any attempts to use the DOS or sound again for non-image problems? Uh, so like on, on this like, discrete app, like what you're using? Yeah. Um, I... I I don't want to say no because I'm, you know, Google Scholar right now, and you probably find something. But <laughs> as far as I know, no. But I could be wrong. Uh, yeah, I, I, yes. Okay, and then also, as far as I understand, mm -hmm. uh, one of the reason GANs are as effective as they are on image problems mm -hmm. is that images tend to lie in like a low-dimensional manifold. Mm -hmm. uh, is there like a reason to suspect that medical data also tends to lie on a low-dimensional manifold? Mm -hmm. Um, that's a good question. Um, I don't know if that's been shown, um, but that's definitely something to look into. Because if it can't be, if it can be shown that that, that is not true, then you know, it kind of presents a big issue. So, I guess maybe one thing yeah. you might be able to check to uh, like, I guess not confirm or like prove, but just to like not repeat that to see how. Scans have performed generating medical data as opposed to generating uh, fake images. Like, you right. know if, if they perform comparably or not. So we're working. So so with the, the data that we have we have created, we are getting pretty good results. Uh, the other thing that I will say is we have a di we have a slightly different trade off than a lot of the other games, which is the privacy aspect of it. And so while I will say I think maybe if you wanted to capture every single person, it would be harder to to be able to uh, translate all that data to a low dimensional manifold, it, like you would miss some of those outliers. But in some ways, you want to you want to find balance because you want you don't want to miss the outliers, but at the same time, you want to miss them enough that you're not creating you're not just taking uh, creating nice synthetic data and then pulling your outlier directly from the data and putting it on the top, uh, basically exposing their data to the world. Um, so. Basically, you want medical data to encompass uh, to, as much of the image as you can without exposing any, you know, of the of the actual private data. And so that's kind of the, the one of the balances we're also looking at is the privacy versus resemblance in terms of um, how we can ensure that we are not releasing private data, but it's good enough that students can use it. Yeah. So how do you measure the accuracy of the synthetic data? Because you're not. Comparing it to real data. Yeah, so um, so some of the metrics we've used in the past are basically trying to do prediction tests in terms of like let's say you have who uh, well, so so that's actually some of the work this summer was done on that. Um, so basically, what happened was we over the summer we had some students who uh, what we had them do was uh, recreate papers that were using the mimic data set. Um, so the data set we're using primarily for this is uh, the mimic data set, which is. I don't remember what the stands for, but basically it's ICU data in Boston, in a hospital in Boston, and uh, so it's very specific. You know, all ICU data in one location, but it, it provides us a good um, amount of data to work with and be able to generate synthetic data for. And so one of the and so there's a lot of papers on that data because it's publicly somewhat somewhat publicly available anonymized data. So a lot of people write papers on it. Um, and so what we did was we replicated five different papers. That we're using the original mimic data, and we replicated it, the process with the original mimic data just as a baseline, but then also with our synthetic data, and we could get um, comparable results on, on most of the papers. So, so that's like one of the methods, and I mean, especially that is especially what we care about, being able to have students come in and say, replicate this paper on this synthetic data, uh, and they're able to do it, or start an idea similar to this paper, you know. And, and the idea is that we have this, this data generated specifically for that purpose, so it's a little bit easier because we can specifically generate columns. We don't have to generate the entire data set, right? It's just some specific columns. And make sure that that relationship exists so that students can learn how to use it. But 
there were also some interesting discoveries, right? Yes. Like that the whole time series issue, right? Was that wasn't there problems uh, generating you know, replicating results where there were time series? I don't generate any time series yeah. yet. So yes, there are problems because I don't do it. I know, but wasn't that one of the results in one of the? Uh, I I'm thought, not sure. I thought one of the papers. Possibly. That, yeah. Yeah. Um, that was definitely one where we found the categorical issues where certain categories were just not showing up uh, because they're very rare. And you just so so one of the categories in the data is um, language. Hospital in Boston, ninety-eight percent, ninety-five percent of people speak English. Uh, and then probably like a couple more of the, those percents are like Spanish. But all of them there's a long tail of like, you know, a hundred other languages that one person came in and with speaking that language. We, were, we didn't really produce, produce those people very frequently. So, and, and the other thing we learned is if you want to teach students how to understand papers, write papers, and, and yeah. do reproducible research, make them reproduce the results of five <laughs> papers in six weeks, <laughs> and and do the work, do it twice, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. with two sets of data. Yeah. Ah! <laughs> Good job, Andrew, for leading them on that. Could you talk a little bit about your uh, you, you mentioned briefly the workflow you've created. Talk a little bit more in detail about your, your, your process, what you're using as a platform and that kind of stuff. Um, sure. Um, like using the idea server, is that what you're going to well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> using the cluster provided by the Institute of Data Exploration. <laughs> So yeah, so so a lot of a lot of uh, GAN, deep learning, neural networks, all that kind of stuff. It really uh, helps to be running that on a graphics uh, card, your GPU. Uh, and so, um, luckily, on the idea cluster, we have four of them, and so we're able to basically um, once I create all the data and I'm inputting it into um, I'm using Python, which is using and using TensorFlow. It's able to do all those uh, computations across all using all four GPUs um, uh, very quickly, uh, and so um, able to generate the data. That way. Are we addressing? Yeah. Well, and then and also kind of what your tools are. Yeah. I mean, you talked about Python, but you're using yeah. you're doing Jupyter notebooks locally and. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. So 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 that's true. Okay. So so yeah, I'm using Python, which is using TensorFlow in the back end. TensorFlow <laughs> is a um, yeah, so TensorFlow is developed by Google. Uh, it's uh, it's got what, C bindings, I believe, C plus plus bindings. Basically, it's a, a low level, heavily optimized uh, uh, interface for um, graph. It, it basically, you create computation graphs that run on a GPU or on your on your um, CPUs, and and basically you you create this computation graph. In this case, it's the neural network. And you're running it, running those computations, and you're sending that to the GPU. So Python, which is very slow, is not actually doing any of the computation as much as you're developing this computation graph that you're then sending to the GPU uh, and getting back the results. Um, and then, so yeah, once I have the results, I'm also using things like <coughs> Jupyter Notebooks and Python then to analyze the results uh, using Pandas, NumPy, Matplotlib, that kind of stuff. Um, but you could also do that all in R, um, which, you know, using the idea cluster, which has our studio server. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Have you noticed any difference in the cluster uh, performance being far away at all, or like in Boston? Or oh, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, because he's actually using the cluster. Yeah. I mean, he's not doing it no, I don't in know. remote <laughs> invocation. <laughs> like, I, it's slower for me, like, if I use the... I don't use the VPN, if that's your question. Oh yeah. Okay. I I just SSH. VPN slow. Well, he's no he's so he's not using not Jupyter using notebook on the cluster. You should yeah. Yeah. I use that little place. Probably a good idea. Probably for a large scale company. Basically, what I do. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? Maybe. Oh, yes. Yeah. Was there what other um, algorithms? Do you before you got to one percent. Oh yeah. Um, so so we've looked at some other ones. So synthetic data vault is one of them. Um, that one is a little bit more. So so okay. Um, to back up a step, basically what was very important for our project is so we're going on to work with OptimLabs, and so OptimLabs is uh, the has all the health data for everyone in the United Health Group. 
Um, so they have a lot of really good health data, but because of that, it's very important that they do not let any of the data out. So we're using a sandbox environment with them. And so what we want to get out of that is a model. We can't export actual data because you know there's a concern whether that data is the real data or not. So basically, we want to look at all their data, create this smaller, much smaller model that we can then export and kind of be sure that that isn't taking our entire database into that box. Okay. Um, so, so part of that kind of out, uh, rules out a bunch of things. Um, so the synthetic data vault was kind of ruled out because a lot of what that does to create the model is look at like means and standard deviations and stuff like that, which is statistics that they really don't want you to export anything. Anyway. Uh, the idea behind your neural network is that you know it's kind of unintelligible what it's exporting, <laughs> so no one can really pull real data like pull the real data back out of that. Um, so there's other things like parsing windows, which would, similar idea. You can't use those because it's again just boiling down the same. It's it's like pulling out like summary statistics, which they still don't really want you to, um, and isn't as useful in some cases. Um, so things like the GANs are, are nice and ideal for that. Um, you can also do things like uh, random forests. So we've done uh, random forests, basically creating a random forest for each column, outputting, outputting data from that. Um, so that's another method. Um, I'm trying to think of some of the other ones we used. Um, one of the things that synthetic data vaults uses is Gaussian copulas. Um, and so that uh, it, 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 it's a similar idea of like, it, it, so the, the idea with those is that you can measure the relationship between all the columns, which is important. Um, the GAN kind of inherently does that, ideally. Uh, but like, that's another thing. If you're going to just do standard deviations and means of columns, you need to make sure you, you measure the relationship between all the columns. And that's, that's really important, too. You can generate a lot of columns that make sense, but like when you look at the row, it doesn't make any sense. So, uh, that was something that was an issue with the MedGAN was that, uh, especially for disease diagnoses, you would have uh, situations where you would have a male-only disease and a female-only disease and on a single patient. Right. <laughs> so, okay. yeah. And in that, um, what did you use for training? I was curious. Training data to, so that it didn't wind up with the, the male that has a female-only disease. Training data that you used at any point. Is that how you? So, so the data. I mean, the data set that we have doesn't have any instances like that. It's just that because it, it was the same idea. It's because it was, this was the MedGAN. It was the same idea where it's trying to put all these diseases in one instance. It doesn't really know the relationship that exists there, and the discriminator can't really decide that that's fake or real or regard. So, so I mean, there you can enforce rules. Uh, so that generator. I mean, that's that's one of the things where you could like. Put in your own rule in the generator to, to discourage that or, or something like that. Um, yeah? From a more theoretical standpoint, are there any papers or any justifications as to why GAN is to be able to uh, generate table data as opposed to like, image or other data? Or do you want to work on that? Is like, mm -hmm. there, there any theoretical work on I'm not that? sure. Uh, I don't. I, I, as far as I know, I don't. I don't really think so. Um, I, I, it is mostly image data that's out there. Um, so yeah, I mean that's definitely something to, to consider. But that's uh, it's part of the reason why we're we're shifting the data into the format of like zero to one, uh, zero to one and stuff like that in terms of like trying to make it more uniform. Because that's really what a lot of those papers are, are about. But similar to what Alex said, I mean, yeah, the other idea is like we boil down into something smaller. Uh, and so that it definitely kind of varies from data to data set to data set. But in the, again, with the medical data and the goal of kind of getting the, the basis of that data out, it's, it's, it makes more sense for our application. Now, if you wanted to make a perfectly, uh, like a, a very perfect synthetic data set that ideally replicates the, other, the, the original data set, it might be harder to prove that, but at the same time, we don't want to make it utterly perfect because then you're probably exposing people to the, like, we, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's because of the balance that we're trying to hit, I guess. Um, but yeah, I, 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 I'm, I don't think I've seen many results with non-image or blanking right now. I feel like I saw something else, but I'm gonna rock that my head. <laughs> well, and uh, the point, as you said, it's it's not to we're not trying to cr recreate 
um, or produce a data set with identical statistics. Yeah. Um, it's to produce a, a uh, data set with similar, similar right. statistics that you could use for, um, for like pedagogical purposes, teaching, that sort of thing, or, or <coughs> things like Kegel contests that would yeah. be, you know, this is plausibly uh, medical data. Um, it's not intended to be like, let's, let's do hardcore research and discover things right. with it. Um, but at the same saying that you could use it. And this is what got the funding for it is being able to use it to teach how to construct workflows or to model workflows or, to, um, that, that sort of thing. Um, and, um, and, uh, uh, people like Optum labs are very interested in it because they've got this, you know, amazing data warehouse with almost 200 million lives you know, spread across clinical records and claims records. Um, but they, uh, which would be beautiful to teach from, and you can't, you know, it has to be, even though it's double anonymized and all this kind of stuff, you can't release that um, for lots of reasons. But if you could create a synthetic data set that had a lot of the characteristics of it, that's amazing, you know, that, that, that it's a really useful tool. Um, so that's why, that's why we're doing it. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions for Andrew? All right. Want to do a quick sell of your, your talk next week? It's a um, one minute version. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Andre is, is going to, you know, same time, same channel. Uh, so my talk has to do with uh, anomaly detection, um, but it's doing it so that you can uh, link the anomalies to an actual underlying causal physical model. And so it does that using elements of feedback control theory and there's some differential equations involved in the class domain. So it's uh, like a combination of data mining and feedback control theory. Very cool stuff. Next week, right here. With applications to circadian and other places. Yeah. All right, so let's thank Andrew. Yeah. All right. All right, and we stop the broadcast, right?